This is Too Hot for Radio, the podcast brought to you by Good News Broadcasting. My name is Tom and I'm the director of GMBA and uh, I'm without Stuart today. He's not in the studio with me, so I have prepared to have a guest on the phone to keep me company. Paul Levy is the minister of IPC in Ealing. That's a Presbyterian church. Thanks for joining me today, Paul. Are you well? I'm doing well. I'm doing well indeed. Now, some of the podcasts I listen to, they always talk about the beverages that they're drinking. I'm just realising I'm just sat here with a cup of tea. I don't know, I don't suppose you've got anything particularly interesting before you right now. I've not. I've just had lunch. I have, a, I have a can of Coke, one can of Coke a day. So I have that I'm at lunchtime. I guess yeah. two o'clock in the afternoon, it'd be slightly concerning if you were on the single malt or... <laughs> <laughs> Never before midday is, uh, is the rule, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about cool church we mentioned a little bit about this on the podcast a while ago i guess today then would be even cooler church so uh, what is your take there is a a rise at the moment real interest i guess particularly in america of these uh, lots of celebrities young celebrities attending these ginormous churches with the smoke machines and the flashing lights celebrity pastors i mean should we be encouraged by that do you see that and just go that's great there's loads of famous people going to famous churches um, I'm pretty pretty much unaware of the trend. I'm not sure I'd be that encouraged. I don't know a great deal about the churches, but this kind of thing happens off. You just have churches which ape the culture and look very much like the culture which they're in, and it passes, and there's not much longevity, I suspect, to many of these churches. I might be wrong. What is cool and what is trendy is very fleeting, isn't it? Churches were at the cutting edge five years ago and no longer at the cutting edge, and you're constantly having to reinvent yourself if you're trying to be cool. The aim of, of church life is to be faithful, isn't it? And so to be pleasing um, to the Lord Jesus and what it means to be a church after the biblical pattern is, is that you're following biblical teaching. And so the New Testament is pretty clear that normally the people that are converted are, are not the high flyers and the movers and shakers in culture. It's, there's not many of noble birth. We, we thank God that there are some. But actually, ordinarily, the kind of people that followed the Lord Jesus and the kind of people that were attracted to the gospel were the broken, the needy, those who weren't cool in in the world's eyes. Praise God that there are some people out there who are well-known and famous and have been wonderfully converted. That That's a great thing, but ordinarily, that's, our churches are not going to be cool just by the nature of the message of the gospel that the cross is foolishness in the eyes of the world any preacher that that's sought to to preach the cross is aware just of the weakness of the message and so that isn't going to appeal to the cool and the trendy people are simply starting churches just as they want do you see any danger of that i'm aware of a number of places where people just go actually it's time to start a church now one thing to plant a church as part of a denomination or, or a movement or something with, do you know what I mean, a board of trustees or whatever. Yeah, um, what yeah. do you make of, of people just planting a church? Is there any danger in that? Yeah, I think there's there's massive danger in just kind of doing it completely independently. And so Christ has ordained, doesn't it, that we should be, we should be part of his church, that mm-hmm. there's a structure to that. New Testament outlines that there should be elders and deacons are the equivalent, but there are structures of authority. And so from my perspective, the Bible teaches a kind of form of church government. Not not every Christian would agree on that. But even those that wouldn't agree with the beautiful thing that Presbyterianism is, or even Anglicanism, there is structure in Christ's church, and we need accountability. The pastoral epistles are detailed in their requirements of, of what a church leader should be and what an elder should be. And so scripturally, you just think, right, I'm going to start. I'm going to start a church off on my own. Yeah, it would seem to me to be a pretty unbiblical thing mm. and quite a dangerous thing. It'd be interesting to know a little bit more about the church that you lead then, because I hope this doesn't come across as rude, but I don't think people would automatically put IPC as part of a, a cool church movement. But saying that, there's been great growth. You know, I mean, I've been really privileged to see that over the years, mm. uh, visiting maybe once or twice a year. So what do you put that down to? People will say, you know, I don't see any celebrities there and there's some liturgy there. We don't Mm -hmm. see a full uh, music band even that is kind of just the norm in many churches. What do you put the the growth down to? That's very kind. Um, God has been good and we believe that the word of God does its work. And Mm -hmm. so as you faithfully preach and teach the scriptures and seek to apply that to church life, 
ordinarily, not not always, there will be growth. So it's it's like the farmer in in Mark four who went out and he sowed the word, and then he goes to sleep, and when he gets up, it's grown, and he doesn't really know how it's grown. <laughs> and so, I think that would be my experience. That actually, as we seek to to teach the Bible faithfully and apply that in church life, to have worship which is prescribed by God's word and so it is a really simple service and trying to stand in the historic line of Christianity by using the creeds and having a confession of sin so that we acknowledge our guilt before God and receive his pardon and then preaching the word of God as as faithfully as we can. There's also the element of of what the word does in the lives of people and so if people are sitting in a biblical church it should it should make them hospitable and should make them generous and that's what we've seen there's no magic bullet I, I wish there was I'd write a book on it if there was but but it is actually just the faithful teaching of God's word and that's what we've seen in Ealing the growth hasn't been enormous it's slow and gradual but people have come to faith and people have, have grown and that's what we've seen in, in the denomination it's just guys going to places and being sent by the denomination and preaching God's word and and slow growth. It's nothing dramatic, you know, it's not revival and the numbers are not huge, but there has been really encouraging growth the last kind of 10, 12 years. I was reading a particularly depressing article recently, that, particularly the Church of England, that if you removed immigration, the, the numbers that immigration brings to the Anglican Church, yeah. take that out, and you're looking at a date of 2067 for when wow. um, the Anglican Church, you can turn the lights off. It was a secular article, so that's removing yeah. the, the work of the Lord. But I guess sometimes we take that scripture, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail uh, against the church as somehow a promise to a specific denomination or even a specific area. It seems like there's a real move of God amongst Iranians uh, at the yeah. moment. I yeah, don't definitely. think there's a promise right now for, my, you know what I mean, my little neck of the church to be to be safe and secure. It is days of small things. The majority of people that we've seen converted have been from outside of the UK. I think the, like the other area is, is we're, we're obsessed, aren't we, with numerical growth. Yeah. And so very often when we talk about growth, we're talking about numbers, but actually God is more concerned about the maturity and Christ being formed in his people. And that's one of the things that encourages me that as I look out on a Sunday, I can, there are people that I've seen their lives transformed by the word of God. Mm. Um, they're not what they should be and, and they're not what they will be but they aren't they aren't what they were and so in the whole area of growth it's it's to think more of fruitfulness and people's character being formed into the likeness of christ but the other thing is people from my perspective from a kind of reform perspective can often hide behind that and there should ordinarily be numerical growth as well of people being added to the kingdom as God's word is taught. It's not an easy subject. You know, there are people out there in church history that labored faithfully for decades and decades and, and didn't see growth. So I'm not saying it's always straightforward and there should, there's always a correlation between faithfulness and growing numbers. I think that, I don't think you can say that. Do you remember reading uh, Don Carson's memoir about his yeah. father, who'd just been yeah. incredibly faithful, hadn't he, in a very difficult area yeah. of, uh, I think most of yeah. Canada is, is is historically quite difficult with the to take the evangelical message. You mentioned um, the Reformed faith there, obviously that you yeah. were part of yeah. being Presbyterian, and yeah. uh, as much as there has been a growth in the the Hillsong and the those kind of cool churches possibly, there there is a real spike or rise, it seems, in, in interest in Reformed theology, kind of at the same same time what do you put that down to there's a real desire amongst people i think for kind of meat and doctrinal teaching i, I think yeah you can argue the kind of shallowness sometimes of evangelicalism and people desiring more of that and discovering the richness of what the church has believed historically from my perspective there's, there's a kind of growing interest in the sovereignty of god and the those truths affecting salvation and how people are converted. And, you know, John Piper has had a huge influence on that and the influence of folk in the state. There's probably not so much of a revival of interest in Reformed ecclesiology and the doctrine of the church as I'd want them to be. <laughs> I would love people to be more excited about the Reformed confessions, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and because of the treasures that, that are held there. But it is, it is exciting. I think a lot of those guys in the U.S., 
scale of the Gospel Men and others like them, they, they have quite a reach into the UK. And the UK is always a little bit behind, isn't it, mm. the trends in the US. And so, you know, the last 10, 15 years, I've seen these kind of mega conferences of Reformed theology. And, and maybe there's something of that happening in the UK. You know, there's problems with that and kind of celebrity culture, which people often talk about, and the kind of the danger of trusting in princes and trusting in men. You can see that within the kind of reformed world in the US. But in the UK, I I, I, I generally think it's encouraging that there are a growing number, not not just IPC, a growing number of, of churches which are preaching the reformed faith and God as he should be preached. You mentioned there about these large conferences and exceptional preachers from America. What, what's your take as a as a local church pastor in London, knowing that the access for your congregation now could be listening to all manner of names that you and I could yeah. name? It's both a privilege and hugely dangerous, isn't it? Mm. So every time we sit under God's word, there's a confrontation between my will and God's word. And I am to experience that in the community and fellowship of believers. So there's something different about when I gather with the people of God on the Lord's Day to worship him and hear his word. That That is different from me sticking on John Piper before I go for a run, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I think there are wonderful things that we have access to, to magnificent Bible teaching, but it, it must never take the place of the worshipping community Sunday by Sunday, the church. We had a guy in our church that used to say that he used to listen to sermons to put him to sleep. Um, <laughs> and so that's not the purpose of the Word of God. It's interesting, isn't it? You often listen to the sermon and it's divorced from what has gone before in the service and what comes afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm not sure that is particularly helpful. You know, the whole of a service from the opening call to worship to the benediction declaration of god's blessing that that all should fit together and so the danger of being sermon tasters and so if if there's part of a sermon that i'm listening to online that i don't like i just turn it off when actually god's word because it's confrontational i I need to hear it even when i don't like it and i need to hear it with other brothers and sisters so it's it's both good and bad i also think these men are amazing God has gifted them as amazing communicators. And the average local pastor isn't isn't like that. We're just trying to feed God's people for another week. It can be hard, can't it, when somebody says, oh, actually, I heard Tim Keller on that passage, or I heard (laughs) Matt Chandler on that passage, and they were amazing. Well, the Lord gives different giftings to preachers, and some are 10 talent men, and there are those who are two or three talent men. But but if if God has put that person as your pastor, he, he should be your favorite preacher. There's a really great little booklet by Christopher Ash. I was just thinking about that. How to listen? Is it how to listen to how to listen to a sermon or something? Yeah, we found that really helpful yeah. as, a, as a family and as and as a congregation. And there's a great little section at the back which says seven suggestions for encouraging good preaching, or, or basically how to listen to bad sermons. <laughs> um, that I think it's it's a book that we want kind of all our church to have in their hands and kind of take heed of. Mm. So part of this podcast, Stuart, who who is my kind of co-host, he's been uh, a pastor for about 25 years and talks about how hard it was at points, how in a sense he'd kind of love to get back to it. But how are you continuing on? You've done a number of years now. Is it 12 years there now? No, it's 17 years. 17, 17 years. years. Yeah. Wow. So uh, what, you know, why are you still there and what, why are you going <laughs> to still be there in years to come? God has been very kind to us, really. God has been very gracious. And I think he's he's given me good elders who are both an encouragement and a support. They they hold me to account. I'm not the only leader. I've got a good wife uh, and happy marriage. <laughs> and it's massively important. That's something I'm very grateful to the Lord for. I, and the congregation has been patient. I came to the church when I was 26. You know, they've just been kind. It's, it's not always been easy. I think I've got a pretty simple view of guidance and that I felt quite strongly that God had brought us here and... Um, apart from maybe on one occasion, I've 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 never really thought that God has kind of been moving us on, and and even then on that occasion, I just needed a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, when I came back from holiday, I, I I felt yeah, this is where we should be. Perseverance in the ministry is you've got to know yourself, and you've got to know when you're tired, and you've got to take your days off. And I think you've also got to not take yourself too seriously. But there is there's a savageness I think to pastoral ministry where you're you're constantly reminded that you're not 
able and not capable of doing it and actually you need the Lord. And it is the work in the work in the UK is slow at the moment. In ministry, like you said before, there's areas of the world where the, where the word of God is running and it, and it doesn't seem to be doing that here. But you keep on pursuing. We're, we're the farmer, aren't we? We are the soldier, we're the athlete of 2 Timothy 2 and actually our job is to be faithful. God on the last day isn't going to ask how successful you've been. He'll, he'll ask how faithful you've been in your marriage and as a father and as a pastor. Like the other things, I think good friends, good, good friends that know you and, and again don't take you very seriously and are able to confront and rebuke you when you need it. We, we all need that. And I think ministers can often isolate themselves. And that is that's just disastrous, really. Uh, have you taken any sabbaticals in that time? Is that a part of... Uh, no, uh, I've not. Like other people have. Um, mm. But um, I've, I, 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 I preach less in July and August, um, noticeably less. Um, and I take three weeks holiday every year in the mm. summertime it takes me a week to wind down it yeah. takes me a week to kind of kind of really enjoy being on holiday and it takes me a week to kind of kind of rev myself back up but i i've not taken smart i've taken kind of two or three weeks here and there of study leave but not not like that i i always think you kind of got to produce something at the end of a sabbatical and i don't know what i'd do apart from watch the british lions tour i always think that would be a great <laughs> thing to go on sabbatical for um <laughs> I find if I if I miss my day off two weeks that that has a noticeable effect. But then it's the same with all of us. That's the way God has wired us, isn't it? To take a Sabbath day mm. and and to take a rest. And and we're really foolish when when we disobey God's commands on that. And I think ministers, well, people like myself, we 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 preach about the sovereignty of God, but actually how much we believe it because we think we're indispensable. That we <laughs> the doctrine of God must teach us that that we're not indispensable. Final thing then, I'd just be interested, anyone who's listening who's who really wants to, well, I guess first find out more about uh, IPC, the the rise of the Presbyterians, but particularly maybe a, is there a book that you would recommend, something that you found really useful kind of coming into ministry? There's a book by um, Donald MacLeod, who's a Scottish theologian called A Faith to Live By, which is just really an exposition of each chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Mm-hmm. And that that is... Um, wonderfully readable. I I would recommend that book really highly. I, th- I think he let us down on the doctrine of creation, but that's that's another matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I I found that book very very helpful indeed. Books on the church. I don't think there is really a, a really good and helpful introduction. So that's why you need to take your sabbatical. <laughs> there's, a, there's a guy in New York. Our minister in New York, Matthew Roberts, I think will write it. Um, right. But there are there are books. There's a little book called Presbytopia which is a terrible title, and I think there's a book called On Being Presbyterian. Both both those books are, they're okay. They're, they're both a little bit American in emphasis, and we need something written by a, a Brit. So. Mm. Well, I've taken enough of your time. Paul Levy, thanks so much for joining us on Too Hot for Radio. Thanks very much, Tom. Okay, we're about done here. Let me just say, if you'd like to find out more uh, about Paul Levy, you can follow him on Twitter. He goes under the name at Ealing Levy, that's L-E-V-Y. And the church website is ipc-ealing.co.uk. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do let other people know. You can send people a link from our website, gnba.net, or tell them to check it on iTunes. Please do write a comment And if you could rate it, that would really help more people hear about this. And if you have any questions or a topic that you'd like us to cover on future editions of Too Hot for Radio, do let us know. Send me an email to info at gnba.net. That's all from me. I'll be back very soon. Thanks so much for listening.